you know what, it's, it's good to see our young people to go to camp. And, uh, and I imagine some of you here, and I know for me and so many others, um, camp had a real impact on our lives spiritually. And uh, so it's good to see those, those testimonies and, and uh, see what, what God was doing in their lives. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good to see you here this morning. Good to be in the house of the Lord, to come together and to worship, to lift up his name on high. I hope you've come this morning ready to experience God, to have a real encounter with him today. We are so glad that you are here. If you are a guest with us today, on our bulletin, you will find an attachment that looks like this. One side says, welcome. Let me invite you to fill this out. We want to be able to respond to you to say thank you for worshiping with us today. And uh, so I hope that while you're here this morning, you'll sense the friendliness of Fairview Baptist Church. But more important than that, you'll sense the presence of Jesus here today. Because we're here to worship him. Amen? Amen. We're here to lift up his name. So if you'll fill that out, if you're a first-time guest with us, uh, when you tear it off, at the end of the service... As you leave the sanctuary on the right-hand side, we've got some greeters there. If you'll hand them the slip, we got a gift bag that we want to give to you as a way of saying thank you for, for worshiping with us today. On the other side, it says decision information. Do you sense the Lord leading you to a decision that you'd like to talk with us about? Want more information about our church? Or if you've got a prayer request, we pray over those. Just take it, fill it out, tear it off, and then um, a little bit later on when the offering plate is passed around, you can just drop it in the offering plate at that time. Let me mention though, we have these, these quilts that are draped across the back of the pews. These are our prayer quilts. And these quilts are going to those who um, we've been praying for and are praying for. And those of you that know what to do with these prayer quilts, we tie knots in them just to let the recipients know that there's a church that is praying for their needs. Let me just very quickly, uh, let you know who these quilts are going to. And while we're doing that through the service, y'all just pass those around and tie the knots. And those of you that are, are sitting maybe next to a guest, show them, show them what to do. We'd love for you to participate in that as well. But these prayer quilts are going uh, this time to uh, Rob Bratcher, who is recovering from a recent kidney transplant. So we'll be praying for him. Kathleen Collins is dealing with a number of uh, health issues and is undergoing testing. Uh, Dominga Cruz is uh, recovering from uh, multiple strokes and undergoing therapy for that, so we want to remember her. Uh, Tara Danley uh, is undergoing treatment for cancer. Uh, Becky Drawn uh, is dealing with a number of uh, just health-related issues, and we want to be praying for her. Nancy Martin uh, is recovering uh, from stroke and uh, is in rehabilitation for that. Uh, Evelyn, uh, Evelina Taylor. Uh, is undergoing cancer treatment, and Donnie White also undergoing cancer treatment. And all of these will be receiving these blankets, letting them know that there's a church family here that loves them, and we are definitely praying for them. And we, uh, we want to do that. So uh, would you join me in a time of prayer this morning? Let's go before the Lord. Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you, O oh God, for the opportunity to be in your house on your day with your people, to worship you and praise you and to give glory to your holy name. You are the God who is worthy of our worship and worthy of our praise and worthy of our adoration. You are the, the holy God. You are the righteous God. You're the creator, almighty God. And we come this morning to give glory and honor and praise to your holy name. I pray this morning, God, that you would be pleased in our worship of you, by our worship of you. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would just speak to every single one of us and open up our hearts and our minds to what you have for us today. Cleanse our hearts and minds of anything that would hinder us from just fixing our eyes on Jesus this morning and focusing on Jesus this morning. And we pray, Heavenly Father, for these that these uh, quilts are being passed around for, Lord, every single one of them has a, 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 a real a physical need. We know that you're the great physician, and so we do the best thing we know to do this morning. And God, that is to lift them before your throne of grace. For you to touch as only you can to bring healing and wholeness and comfort and strength to their bodies and to their lives. We pray, Heavenly Father, for everyone that is here this morning. We've come this morning. We have different needs and different issues and burdens of life as well. 
So this morning, Heavenly Father, speak to our hearts again. We thank you, God, for what you've done. We thank you, God, for what you are going to do in our lives. And so, Heavenly Father, move as only you can move. And Lord, as we have this time of worship, Lord God, just again, speak to us, give to us what we need for our sake, for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Let's stand. Let's continue our time of worship this morning. Let's pray together. I mean, let's sing together. going to um, call on Daniel White. He's going to come forward this morning and um, share a little bit about our va upcoming vacation Bible school, a little testimony, and uh, letting you know uh, what all is about to take place. So Daniel, come speak to us. Hello. How is everybody? Good, good. Well, I guess your anticipation is, and I'm going to tell you how to get plugged in. Well, we're going to wait on that for a minute. So when I'm tired and when I'm weak, and when I'm wore down during vacation Bible school, we all get there. These are the things that lift me up. God is good. He is good all the time. Okay? Vacation Bible school has been around since the 1898 in some way, some version. Most people don't realize that it's been around that way, that long. 25,000 churches reach. 2.5 million people. 70,000 salvations came from Vacation Bible School last year. Does that not make you strong? Does that not make you lift up? Does that not make you want to work for the Lord and to create this atmosphere, a safe place, a warm place, a cool place, a place where kids can enjoy themselves, where they can have a meal? Plug in, please, please come and help. Five days of vacation Bible school is the equivalent of seven months to some of these kids of church, of sitting here in the sanctuary. That's why it's important to give it your all for five days. 
Let's go all or let's go nothing, y'all. Let's do what's right. Let's bring these kids in. Let's invite them. Let's show them what Fairview is, that warm heart, that embrace. Let's just give it our all. So let's go to the work stuff, all right? <laughs> so we've got activities planned for Monday and Tuesday. You can plug in. You can, uh, we're going to be here from 6 until we get done. Wednesday, if we're running behind, knock on wood, it's been a long time since we've had a big work day on Wednesday, so let's get in there and put, push. Today, after church, you can plug in. We need, we need men and women both to help us move. Every classroom in the back has uh, information on the doors of where things need to be moved to. Many hands make light work. Let's make this work out. And like I said the other day, you're just going to be waiting in line at the restaurant, so why not do some service while you're waiting on that time? So, um, Then I wanted to thank everybody for what you've done this far. People are bringing in things, bringing in items. We can always continue to take those things. Kickoff starts at the 21st at 5 o'clock. Susie, if I'm wrong, you correct me on this stuff. And then the rest of the week from 6 to 8.30. Invite people. Give these young people an opportunity to experience the Lord, to feel the power, to feel the energy, to feel what we do. Let's invite them in. Let's embrace them. Thank you for listening to me. If you can't work, look inside your, uh, look inside your bulletin. There's a prayer list. That's your work. If you're not physically able to come and work, if you're not physically able to plug in, I know we still got classrooms, we still got opportunities for everybody to plug in in this church. Everybody can help out with this. But if you're not physically able or you're on vacation, pray for us, please. Take the time to pray for us. You know, it's so important that we do this and we do it right. Thank you for listening. Man, I'm telling tell you what, if that doesn't get you fired up for vacation Bible school, you're just all wet. That's all I got to say. And uh, thank you, Daniel, for that. I'm going to ask our ushers. Our ushers will come on forward. While they're doing that, uh, you know, as we have our time of worship through the giving of our offerings, your offering actually helps. Like Vacation Bible School, that ministry that does reach so many uh, people and families for the Lord Jesus Christ. It provides the, the ministries that we need to have to touch our community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, it's, through, it's through your offerings that enables this church to be able to have the resources to do that. And uh, so I want to challenge you to give, encourage you to give this morning for the glory of God. And uh, let me lead us in the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you so much for, again, the, the privilege of just coming together to worship you and to praise you. And Lord, we thank you for this, um, this time of where we can worship you through the giving of ourselves, the giving of offerings. And so, Lord, I pray that as we give, uh, Lord, you would bless the gift, you would bless the giver, it would be used for your glory and your glory alone as we as a church try to get the gospel out to those here at home and to the nations. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen and amen. I'm going to invite our children's church too, by the way, you can be dismissed. And, uh, and we're at, right now, we're going to be blessed to hear one of our own, Brother Jonathan. Thank you for being here, brother. Thank you. This first song is a song I recorded for my sweet mother-in-law while she was battling cancer. Listen to the words of this one.
I'm going to do this one right here. Um, this is another new song that I recorded a good friend of mine wrote. And um, if you listen to the words of this song, it'll bless you. And if it doesn't bless you, as our pastor just said, you would, something's wrong with you, okay? I believe that we're all going to bow the knee one day. If you listen to the words, try to picture this in your mind, how this all took place. Second verse I love. I love it. Listen to this. In a lone cattle stable in the town of Bethlehem, a baby is born to save fallen man. But he was rejected, the crowd cried crucify, and as an unborn man, Jesus had to die. Just until day three, when out from the grave he rose in mighty victory.
Amen. I'm going to tell you what, we've worshiped, amen? amen? Let me invite you to take your Bibles open, open them with me, if you will, to the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew. We're going to be talking about what he just sung about, to a degree, a little bit. Um, we're in this series where, you know, you've submitted questions, and this summer we're kind of going through this series of questions and answers, and um, today we're going to be answering the question, you know, what about hell? What, what does the Bible say about hell? Um, it's a good question. It's a question that I get asked an awful lot, and so we're going to kind of tackle this and unpack this uh, this morning. Um, several years ago, Pew Research, they did a study on religious beliefs of Americans, and one of the questions that they asked was, you know, what do you believe about hell? And uh, so here's, here's what they found out. They found out that 58% of Americans say that they believe in hell. Now, that was actually down by about 20, uh, by down from 71% in 20 years. So it's very much on the decline of Americans believing in hell. Um, as a matter of fact, belief in hell is declining so fast now in America that it's, you see now a number of articles, a number of books that are be, being written on that. National Geographic just put out an article last year entitled The Campaign to Eliminate Hell. And basically they're saying that's what's happening in, in America today. And um, a couple of years ago, the Wall Street Journal, or just last year, the Wall Street Journal published an article basically asking the question, do, do we really need to believe in hell anymore? And one of the things that, you know, they quoted in that article was this statistic that I just gave you, that 58% of Americans say they believe in hell. The problem with, with even that, not only is it declining fast, but, but of that 58% who said that they believe in hell, their views on hell was radically just across the board. As a matter of fact, when they went on and kind of continued to ask questions, this is what they found. Of that 58% who said they believe in hell, 42% of those said that they believe in hell, but they don't believe that it is a literal place of eternal torment. That hell is just kind of a figurative place. It is a description of some type of, of afterlife punishment, but we really don't know what that is, but it's not going to be a place of eternal torment. 26% said that they really didn't know if hell was a, a literal place or if it was a kind of a figurative place, a symbolic place. Of that 58% who said that they believe in hell, only 32% said hell is a literal place where God will send all those who reject Jesus Christ as his son and as Savior and as Lord, and it will be a place of eternal punishment which means that the vast minority of Americans believe in the hell of the Bible, even among those who claim to be evangelical Christians. You know what's amazing is that virtually 100% of Americans believe in heaven that God is going to reward and God is going to bless, there's going to be this eternal bliss, but, but just a vast minority believe in hell. We're a society that basically says, I'm going to take the Bible and I like this part, so I'm going to kind of believe in that. I don't like what this says, so I'm going to kind of discard that. So let's look at this. What does the Bible say about hell? In the Bible, there's a number of places that we could talk about this, but I'm going to, let me just read Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 47 and going through verse 51. So stand with me, please, in honor of the reading of God's holy word. And, and let's just kind of see what Jesus has to say about hell using this story. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered uh, some of every kind. 
which when it was full, they drew to shore, and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the justice, cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And then Jesus asked the question, Have you understood all these things? And they said to him, yes, Lord. May God bless the reading and hearing of his word. You may be seated. When you look at scripture, it's very clear that hell is a very real place. The fact is, think about it like this. If hell is not real and everybody is eventually going to heaven, as universalists would have you believe, then really what we might as well do is we might as well just kind of throw our Bibles away, leave here, close the church, and and really not come back again. If if everybody's eventually going to heaven, then, then why do we need to come together? Why do we need to go out and share the gospel? Why did Jesus give the Great Commission? Why does he call us to to, to go out into the highways and the byways and to compel them to come to his house? Why, Why bother to do all that if there is no hell? If we're all just going to kind of one day make it into heaven. Hell is very real. I like the story about the Coast Guard chaplain who reported to a, a new duty station, and upon his arrival there, uh, several of, of those that were, that were there came to him, and they asked him, they said, do you believe in a literal hell? And he said, well, no. And they said, well, you need to resign. And he said, well, why is that? They said, well, it's, it's very simple. If hell is, no, is not real, then we don't need you. If hell is real, then we don't, it is a real place, then we don't want you to lead us astray. That's a very good Let me tell you something. As Jonathan just saying, Satan believes in hell. Satan knows there's going to come that day when he will have to bow the But until that day comes, he's doing everything he can to try to populate his hell. It's the reason why he's trying to convince the world there is no hell. It's kind of like, you know, we live in this culture of, of, you know, many people who say, well, I just don't believe in hell. I don't believe in hell. It's like the old revival preacher said, well, look, you're not believing in hell. Doesn't lower the temperature one degree. And that is so true. Hell is a very real place. I want you to know that you have a pastor that believes in a literal hell. And there is coming that day. When God will judge every single person, we're going to look at this in just a minute, God will judge every single person, and there will those who were judged righteous will go to heaven, the righteousness of of Jesus Christ. Those who have rejected Jesus Christ will go to this eternal place of punishment called hell. And that's a fact. The person in the Bible who spoke most about hell and who spoke most graphically about hell was the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He spoke most about it, giving it very vivid descriptions. Twelve times in the Gospels, very explicit about hell. Eleven of those times, he used the word to kind of describe hell. He used the word Gehenna. Now, let me tell you what Gehenna is. Gehenna is a valley that's on the south side of of Jerusalem. It's It's called the Valley of Gehenna. And when when the, the nation of Israel separated from the nation of Judah... Um, uh, the wicked kings of Israel uh, basically used Gehenna and they built an altar in that valley to, the, to this false god called, called Molech. And basically what they would do is people would go to the valley of Gehenna and they would sacrifice their children, throw them into the fires of this altar to this god Molech. This pagan god. Well, when Josiah comes along, there is, he becomes this king that wants to bring the nation back to God. And so he gets rid of, of this altar of Moloch. And he, built, he basically turns Gehenna, that's right outside of Jerusalem. He basically turns this valley into a garbage dump. 
And in this garbage dump, basically what they did is they threw all of the trash, all of, uh, they collected all of the dung, everything, including the bodies of wicked and evil people, and they threw them in this garbage dump. And it smoldered perpetually. From, and the fire never went out. Jesus, later, Jesus, in another parable, describes it as the, the, the place where the fire ne never goes out and the worms never die because the worms just lived in this smoldering fire pit. Jesus said, the best way I know how to describe hell in such a way that you will understand it is it's like this Gehenna that's in the valley just below Jerusalem and Judah. And he says, the only way I know how to describe this in a way that you can really grasp this is it's that place like Gehenna where the fire never goes out. I'm going to tell you what, when you kind of picture that, it's kind of disgusting. It's a very vivid, graphic picture of this perpetually smoldering trash heap. That's exactly how Jesus described hell. I want you to understand this morning that our Lord knew hell to be a very real place. And the, the, the very reason Jesus came to this earth, listen, the very reason why he came to this earth was so that he could save us from this place called hell, save us from God's wrath, save us from God's judgment. That's why he came to save us from this place called hell. So let's take a look at it. Let me give you three, basically, before we kind of get into the characteristics of hell and what the Bible says about it, let me give you three biblical truths that we need, all need to understand. The first one is this, that all people will be, will be brought to judgment before God. All people will be brought to judgment before God. Verses 47 and 48, it says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind which when it was full, they drew it to the shore. In other words, all he's saying is that everybody, he's using this dragnet as, you know, okay, everybody's going to be gathered and everybody's going to be brought to shore. Everybody's going to be brought into judgment. Every person who has ever lived in any age will be judged. The Hebrews writer put it like this, and it is appointed for man to die once, and after that, the judgment. Everybody's going to be judged. Secondly, what we know, what that scripture teaches us, is that there's going to be a separation. There's going to be a separation of the good from the bad. Or another way of saying that, biblically, really, is the term of unrighteous, the, the, the righteous from the unrighteous. There will be a separation of believers from unbelievers, of Christians from non-Christians, from the wicked from the just. There will be that separation. Jesus goes on to say, second part of verse 48 into verse 49, Look at it. And they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but they threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just. In other words, those who have inherited the righteousness of Christ by placing their faith in him, they will be separated from the unrighteous. Those who have not placed their faith in Jesus Christ, there will be a separation of the saved from the unsaved. It's exactly what... Jesus is saying it's exactly what the, the Hebrews writer is saying. The third thing we need to understand is this. The unsaved will be assigned to hell. Will be assigned to hell. Look at verse 50. And cast them into the furnace of fire, where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now, what is Jesus doing? He's just describing hell. And then again, he asked them this question. He said, do you understand what I'm saying? And they said, yes, Lord, we understand. And let me tell you what Jesus was saying, what Jesus was asking. Jesus was asking, do you understand the implications of what I just spoke about? He said, this is, this is not just some story. This, this has real implication for your life. And that basically is there's going to come that time when God will judge every single person who's ever walked the face of the earth. God will bring every single one of them to judgment. And how, what you do with Jesus Christ will determine your eternal destiny. Heaven or hell. That's what Jesus was saying here. Very real implications here for you and for me. When it comes to hell... There are three questions that are most asked. So since this is a series on questions and answers, let me kind of give you these questions and try to answer these questions 
I, I wish I could spend a whole lot more time on these. Obviously, I can't, so I'm going to kind of just, you know, this is kind of a brief description of this. But let me, let me give you these questions and try to answer these for you. The first question that is asked an awful lot is this. Can a good and loving God really send people to hell? I get asked that question a lot. Can, can God, who is really good, actually just send people to hell? Well, to answer that question, you need to look at the character of God. And there, there are three characters that you really need to look at. And so let me just give these to you very quickly. The first character is this. God is love. God is love. Matter of fact, and we know that. The Bible says many times that God is love. Um, the Bible, dozens of times, the Bible describes the love of God for all people. So we need to understand that God is a God of love. That's the first characteristic. God is a God of love. The second one is this. God is not only a God of love, he is holy. God is a holy God. We see that in Isaiah chapter 6. We see it in Revelation as well. When you look at the throne of God and the seraphim and the angels are around the throne of God, do you remember what they're saying? They're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. They didn't just say it once. They said it three times. In other words, basically saying he is perfectly holy. It is who God is. God is a holy God. Now what does that mean? It simply means this, that God is perfectly pure, perfectly righteous. God is without sin. God, there is no evil, there, there is no wickedness, there is no wrong, there is no untruth. There, 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 is, there is nothing about God that is other than he is a perfectly righteous and good God. Which means that sin, listen, sin can no more exist in the presence of God than darkness in the presence of light. And that's a fact. In other words, that, that's why... As, as, as we just heard, that's why right after Satan kind of bows the knee, he's headed for hell. Because evil cannot dwell in the presence of God. He won't have it. That's why when Satan went, and if you'll remember, when Satan rebelled against God and he got all these angels to kind of follow him, what did God do? Because he can't dwell in the presence of evil, what did he do? He cast him out of heaven. He cast him out of heaven. One of the reasons why we're having to deal with that issue right now. And by the way, let me say this. There is absolutely, listen, for, 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 for sinners like you and for me, for us to stand in the presence of a holy God, you do understand that does nothing more than invite our destruction. That's what it does. And there is absolutely nothing you and I can do about that. Not a thing. We can't, but God can that's why Jesus said, hey, with God all things are possible. He was talking about how can man be saved? Only God can do that, and he did it through Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. We, there's nothing you and I can do to become righteous enough to, to get to heaven ourselves. We can't do it. Only God can do it by imputing the righteousness of Christ upon us, and that's exactly what God did. Romans 5, 6 says this, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. God is a holy God and cannot and he will not allow evil, sin, to dwell in his presence. The third thing you need to know about God is this. Because God is a God of love, because God is a holy God, God is also a just God. He's a just God. And what that means is that God, because he is holy, because he is love, because he is just, he must do something about sin must do something about wrongdoing. He demands, His holiness demands that, that he make things right, that he must punish sin, that he must do something about those who choose to disobey him and reject Jesus Christ. And so the answer to the question is, can a good and loving God send people to hell? The answer really is wrapped up in the character of God because God is love, because God is holy. That demands that God also be just. And it's a part of who God is. And by the way, as, as, as we'll see again, but understand, when it, in, in reality, you do understand that God really doesn't send anybody to hell. We choose hell. When we choose to reject Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, understand it's our choice. 
It's our choice whether we go to heaven or whether we go to hell. God doesn't really send us. It's a choice that we make. Question number two. And you've probably heard this question as well. Doesn't hell seem a little extreme for persons who do not accept Jesus Christ as Savior? I mean, you know, we only live on this earth, you know, on the average of what's the average age span now is about 76 years old, you know, so, you know, we only are on this earth for, you know, 70, 80, maybe 90 years or so. And doesn't eternity in hell just seem a little extreme for God to do that? Look at what the Hebrews writer said. I got this there for you. Hebrews chapter 20, chapter 10, verses 28 to 29. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God, has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he has, was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace. The Hebrew writer basically says, let me give you three reasons why hell is not extreme. Let me tell you what we do when we sin, when we reject Jesus Christ. He says, first of all, we trample the Son of God underfoot. It's another way of saying that he's absolutely worthless to me. In the days of the Bible, when salt lost its saltiness and lost its purification of flavoring food or purifying or preserving food, you know what they would do? They would cast it out of their houses. And they would cast it onto the streets. And basically on the streets is where it would get trampled by, it, by the animals and the pie, by, by the people that walked on the street. In other words, when salt became useless, it was cast out to be trampled on. And the Hebrews writer is saying, when we reject Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of our life, we have basically just said, he, we consider him absolutely worthless to us. We're just going to cast him out just to kind of be nothing more of, of value than to be trampled on by anybody. That's what he's saying. That's a pretty serious offense, folks, when you do that against a holy God. But the Hebrew writer said he does even more than that, though. They regarded Christ's blood as unholy or another way of saying it, as common, as no more valuable or of worth than anything else. As a matter of fact, when you, when you think about that, you contrast that with 1 Peter chapter 1. I've got that in there for you. Look at what Peter says. He says, for you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your fathers, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Now, here's, let, let, me, let me give you the kind of the polar opposites here of what's, happened, what's, what's taking place here. When we reject Jesus Christ, basically the Hebrew, Hebrew writer said is we, we have basically profane the blood of Christ, we've considered the blood of Christ of no value to us, that it is of no more worth than the blood of the criminals that were crucified on both on either side of Jesus. But you get to Peter, and Peter holds very high the precious blood of Jesus Christ. By the way, that's why a lot of people, they don't understand, and I hope you do, that they don't understand that when we come to the Lord's table, and we observe the Lord's Supper, and we observe communion, and we hold the cup in our hand which represents the blood of Jesus Christ. We hold that which is in our hand to be very, very significant. It is not just common. It is by the blood of Jesus Christ that our sins have been washed away. Amen? You understand that? It is only by the blood of Christ that you and I can claim we have heaven. It's only by the blood of Jesus Christ that you and I have this eternal life in this wonderful place called heaven. And it is only by the blood of Jesus Christ that you and I escape hell. It's not because of anything we've done. It's not because of anything anybody else has done. Only other what Jesus Christ has done for you and for me. And it is only by the spilled blood of Jesus Christ that our sins are washed, cleansed, we are, we are washed away, our sins are, and so that when God looks at you and me, you know, let me tell you how he looks at us. He looks at us through the blood of Jesus Christ, and when he sees us through the blood of Jesus Christ, you know what he sees? He sees somebody who is 
purely, who is pure and holy and absolutely sinless. Now you need to understand, we know we're sinners. But God, what God did is because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, he took the righteousness of Jesus who was without sin, he took his righteousness and he imputed, he put it upon you and me. So when God sees us, he sees us as righteous. Not because of anything we've done, but because of what Jesus Christ did and his shed blood on the cross of Calvary. And the Hebrews writer was basically saying, when we reject Jesus Christ, we are basically saying that blood that was shed for all mankind, that blood that was shed to cleanse us of our sins, that blood was absolutely no more valuable than anything else. All the wicked people, that blood has no value, has no worth whatsoever. Well, that's a serious offense against a holy God. But then the Hebrew writer said, but we did something else. You want to get worse than that? Yeah, it can get worse than that. Basically, he said, we insulted the Holy Spirit. We insulted the Spirit of grace. And what, simply what he means by that is that when the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin in our life, we say, don't think so. I'm not going to respond to that. I don't, I'm not going to deal with that. I, I am rejecting that. And let me tell you what he's saying. When we reject the conviction of, the, uh, of God, the Holy Spirit, that word insult that he's using there, you know what he's saying? It's as if we are slapping God in the face. We are openly, willfully, publicly slapping God. That's what the word means. It's a pretty serious offense. And so when you look at hell and you say, hey, what, is, is a, doesn't it seem extreme that, that God would send us to an eternal hell? Listen, we need to understand how gross our sin is against an eternal holy God. And when you put it in those terms and you look at it like that, all of a sudden you realize, no, it's not extreme at all. It's judgment. So... The question is, then, why is there this hell? It's very simple. It's because of what we've done. But that leads to another question, it is this. Does an unbeliever consciously choose to reject Jesus? Do we consciously choose to reject Jesus? And the answer is yes to that. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 20. Look at what it says. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. Then it goes on to say, so they are without excuse. Now let me tell you what Paul is saying here to help us kind of understand this. Three things stand out in this passage that we need to grasp a hold of. First of all, God has clearly revealed himself to humanity. He has clearly revealed himself to humanity. Look, look over what it says. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived. In other words, God has revealed himself enough to us just in his creation that we ought to be able to determine that God is this all-powerful God, he is the creator God, and that he is a good God. That's what, that's what Paul is saying here. And then Paul says something else. So God's clearly revealed himself. We all, we, we all believe, you know, know there, there should, there's an existence of God. But then he says something else. He says, but man chose to suppress that truth. Man chose to suppress that truth. Look at verse 18. He says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Now let me tell you what this word means. When he says suppress the truth, it's just, it, it's, in other words, it's a word that's describing the truth raising up, but we're pushing it down. Truth, truth raising up, we're pushing it down. Do you remember... Uh, when you were kids and you were you would get in the pool and you would have uh, you know a ball and and you would you would try to push the ball down, 
remember what would happen? It would pop back, back up, you'd push it back down, it would pop back up, you'd push it back down, try to hold it down, it eventually pop back up. That's what it's describing. We, what we try to do is what man has done is man is, is every time the truth of God rises up, and it rises up in so many different ways, what we try to do is we try to push it down. And then, so then what happens is it comes back up. And so what, what are we, every time we hear the truth, you know what we're doing? This is what's happening in special. I, I see this all the time in our, in our culture today. But every time the truth is heard, what we try to do to kind of make our feel selves feel better about it as, as, as a nation, as a culture, is we suppress that truth. We push it down. We push it down, but it comes back up. We push it down. It's exactly what it's describing here. We have chosen to suppress the truth. That's what the wicked do. That's what ungodly people do. And then Paul said something else. They do that, number three, he said they know the penalty. Knowing the penalty. Knowing that, knowing that God in his righteousness has declared that those who reject him will receive their just punishment. That's what he's saying in Romans chapter 1 and verse 32. Though they know God's righteous decrees that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Man, if that's not contemporary today, I don't know what is. It's exactly what's happening. Now, again, let me say this, and I want you to hear this very clear, care, carefully, clearly. God doesn't really send anybody to hell. We choose it. We choose it when we know the truth, hear the truth, but we suppress the truth, knowing, knowing the punishment. And that's what happens. So let me give you then the characteristics of hell. And again, I could spend 10 sermons on this. So this morning's just kind of a, a synopsis of this. But let me give you the characteristics of hell. Because I want you to understand what the Bible says about it. Number one, hell is a place prepared for Satan and his followers. That's exactly what we heard. It's a place prepared for Satan and his followers. Verse 41 of Matthew 25. Then he will also to say those on the, on the left, on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. It's that, it's that place prepared for Satan, for his demons, for all those who reject Jesus Christ. And I don't know about you, but I want you to think about this for a minute. I, I, I cannot imagine being in a place that was prepared for somebody that was so evil, so wicked, so grotesque, so immoral, so violent, so unholy, that he is the very personification of evil himself. That is Satan. I can't imagine that for the rest of eternity I would be confined to a place like that. And yet that's what the Bible says will happen to all those who reject Jesus Christ. Hell is not only a place prepared for Satan and his followers. Hell is a place of emotional anguish. It's a place of emotional anguish. Jesus said in verse 50, there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. That wailing describes emotional despair. All of a sudden, when we, well, we will realize we have wasted our lives. And for the rest of eternity, there is absolutely no hope of ever getting into a right relationship with God. For the rest of eternity, there's no hope that we will ever see God. We will ever spend eternity in heaven with our loved ones who are there, with friends who are there. There is this awesome aloneness about hell. A dark solitude aloneness. Let me tell you why. Because in hell, everybody's concerned about themselves. They couldn't care less about you. They're concerned about their own anguish. They're concerned about their, about their own pain. Number three, hell is a place of physical pain. Of physical pain. Jesus said there's gnashing of teeth. That's just describing that, that physical pain in hell. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus tells about the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And the rich man dies, remember the story, goes to hell. And Luke chapter 16, verse 24, then it says, Then he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. 
It's a place of torment. And Matthew is described as eternal fire in Revelation. is described as the lake of fire, a fiery pit, a furnace of fire. It's simply just meant to describe that place of suffering. By the way, one of the questions that is asked a lot is, hey, will, we, will, will, will there be consciousness in hell? Will, will we be aware of hell uh, and what's happening in hell? And the answer is absolutely. That story just confirms that. Number four, hell is a place of eternal punishment. It's a place of eternal punishment. Jesus said in Matthew 25, 46, and these will go away into everlasting punishment and the righteous into eternal and to everlasting life. Let me tell you what's going to make hell incredibly hell. It's the understanding and the realization that we're going to be there for eternity. That's what makes it so bad. That there is no hope of ever escaping hell. And that leads to number five. Hell is a place of spiritual suffering. Matthew chapter 8 verse 12. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. Second Thessalonians, Paul put it like this. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Have you ever found yourself in a place that is so dark, I mean absolutely no light, what's so dark that you could feel it? You could just feel the darkness? Hell will be like that. God is light. And God will not be in heaven, so therefore there will be no light in heaven. And there will, it will be this place of, of great, great darkness. That's what Jesus is saying here. There's, you know, right now, think about it this way. Even the wicked right now in this world have the blessing of God's presence in this world. You know, God's, you know, through Christians, you know, God is using Christians to bring light into this world. Um, when God places his blessing upon a community, upon um, a, a nation, those who are evil still kind of reap the benefits of that. But understand, in hell, all of that is gone. No God, no Jesus, no Holy Spirit, no light, no love of God, no blessing, none of that. It's gone. It's gone. Jerry Silcox is a New York fighter fighter and a Christian who helped search for survivors at Ground Zero. He said he and his fellow workers called Ground Zero the pit. Listen to how he described it. He said, almost everywhere I looked, mighty columns of steel were twisted into sad, pointless sculptures towering over the tragic scene as we worked to find survivors. Gray smoke was everywhere. I'm no theologian. I'm a New York firefighter, but I can't imagine hell being much worse than the pit. I don't know what hell is like, but I've seen a place so bad that I want to do everything I can to make sure that my friends, my family, and my neighbors know Jesus Christ and will spend eternity with him and not in hell. Let me tell you something, church. The reality of hell ought to cause every single one of us sitting here this morning to want to get the gospel out, to want to share it with those around us, to try to get it to those who don't know Jesus Christ because what is awaiting them if they don't make that decision for Christ literally is hell. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Every head bowed and just every eye closed before the Lord, just sensing his presence this morning. Jesus came and died on the cross to save us from hell. And if there's somebody here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, in a moment we're going to stand and sing a song. That would be an opportunity for you to, to come and say, hey, hey, Pastor Jesus, you know, I, I need Jesus. Right now, if I were to die today, pretty sure I'm going to hell and not to heaven. We've got people here who can share with you how to do that, how you can have Jesus Christ as Savior of your life. Maybe you've made that decision for Christ, but you've not yet followed him in baptism. That's an act of obedience, showing that Jesus Christ is Lord of your life. You come and say, Pastor, Jesus is Lord. I need to be baptized, and we'll schedule a time to do that. Or maybe you need a church home. We'd love for you to be a part of what God is doing at Fairview Baptist Church, and in our bulletin is information on how you do that by 
attending our membership class used to tear off and say, sign me up for the next one. We'll contact you and we'll do that. We'd love for you to be a part of what God is doing here. God wants all believers to be a part of a local church family. We'd love for you to be a part of what God is doing here. Heavenly Father, speak to us. Lord, if there's somebody here this morning that don't know you as Savior, may today be that day where they claim the name of Jesus for salvation from hell and for heaven. Heavenly Father, touch us this morning. Lord, do what only you can do in our lives this morning. Help us to make decisions we need to make right now for our sake and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. Let's sing together. If you have a decision to make, it comes with us. may be seated for just, just a couple of moments. Uh, if you'll just take note of, of everything that is going on in the life of the church, of course, you know that you know, Vacation Bible School is coming up, so let me encourage you to, to continue to pray for Vacation Bible School and you know, help out where you can. Um, that would be very much appreciated. Uh, and, and pray for it. Make it a part of your daily prayer life from now through Vacation Bible School. Also, the, the, uh, the dental clinic that we're going to be doing on August the 3rd, um, if you can help with that, you can let me know. You can let Jennifer White know. Uh, just, you know and uh, we'd love for you to help out with that. That's one way of ministering to our community. So take note of that. And if you will, just take note of all of the other announcements that are there in the bulletin as well. And... Um, uh, a lot of things that are going on in the life of our church in the days to come. Also, by the way, um, uh, we, we're having shirts made up in different colors, blue, gray, white, and red. This is a sample of the red one. It's got the new church logo and the church name under it. And uh, these are very nice shirts, but um, we are making these available for $20, basically just the cost for the church. And uh, starting next week, you'll be, if you want one, just we'll have a way for you to sign up to get one. But uh, anyway, several people, when we gave out the T-shirts, or did the T-shirts, asked if we could do these types, and so we are doing that. So take note of that, and I think that's it. Have I left anything out? Any other announcements? Good. I hope everybody has a blessed, blessed day today. Let's stand together. Brother Tommy, would you dismiss us in a word of prayer?